So don't worry, there's no test at the end. You don't need to write an essay. I just want to make sure perhaps we understand what some of the current terminology of progressive lenses means because you hear a lot of stuff out there. Um, the new talk is free form and digital. I'm not quite sure what those two things mean. Digital means that it's manufactured on a CNC type of surfacing machine. And depending on the software that they use to manufacture lenses, they could be free form or not. To me, free form means that I, as an optometrist, have complete control over what I want that lens to work like. Okay, but I don't think there's many lenses, if any, that you have full control over for everything in the lens. Well, there might be one. Two, you know, when we have vague terms like this, it makes it easy marketing uh, stuff. You can market things, fancy names. We love that. You know, oh yeah, wavefront, free form, you know, uh, in the third order aberrations. I know, can, you can keep going. Some technology is very important and it does work. Other technology has been borrowed from other aspects of optics and it makes us feel comfortable that this is cutting edge. It's just words. So anyway, so free form and digital are good as long as we're talking about the benefits that that technology brings us and not just the generic terminology of free form and digital. Atoric, aspheric, isophoric, isoconic, isogonal. Yeah, we'll get to that maybe. Now, I want to talk about something about digital lenses. The, you, we can make digital lenses a number of different ways. We can either start off with a legacy type of lens, you know, traditional, conventionally molded lens where the front is molded with the progressive corridor on the front, and then we apply a back surface that supposedly fixes the aberrations, and that would be typically the legacy lens is modified, and that would be things like Nikon W or I, I forget, and SLO Physio, um, and a bunch of other lenses that use legacy product with an atoric back surface. Then we have the other class of digital lenses where they actually put the ad and the cylinder and the RX power on the back surface using a complex manufacturing method to create a back surface progressive. We also have to think about position of wear. We can't apply paraxial optics to spectacle lenses. So the optics we learned in school really are not of value in progressive lens design because we have to look at the way the eye looks through the lenses in different positions of gaze and imagine that wherever they look, there's a lens there, there's a lens there, there's a lens there, and we blend those all together to create a pair of glasses. So the phosimeter, when we use the phosimeter to measure the actual power of a lens, it looks down through here. But that's not what the eye sees. The eye sees obliquely through the lens and the phosimeter looks tangentially or perpendicular to the tangent of the lens. So we need to think more about how the eye looks through a lens and less how the lensometer looks through a lens. You don't have to know any math for that, just as a concept. When we look obliquely through a lens, we create first order aberrations. There is a test on this at the end. And physicists called Seidel figured out this out for telescopes. And telescopes, we're trying to look at distant stars. And he had written down or figured out what aberrations affect the resolving power of a telescope. So we have spherical aberration, coma. Now, you know what coma looks like? It's like a teardrop blur. Astigmatism is a stretchy blur. Curvature of field means that things are obviously curved. And distortion means that things don't come out flat. All these things affect how well a spectacle lens corrects vision. Okay? And these are things within the purview of designing a progressive digital lens. So these are the aberrations that are important. And we can mathematize those, and we can make digital progressive lenses, and that's how that works. Let's move on to dealing with one of the biggest 
advances that digital lenses provide, both single vision and progressive, and that's the case of high plus corrections with astigmatism. We've used aspheric lenses a long time. You've all used Cosmolit or spectral light aspheric, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What do you do when there's a lot of astigmatism? So, you know, if it's plano, if it's plus four, minus four at 180, we need to have an aspheric on the plus four meridian, but we don't need asphericity in the plano meridian. And the asphericity might be as much as a diopter. So that patient is going to experience an extra minus one along 180 and then have it corrected along the 90th meridian. And if you look at this prescription here, plus 675 minus 1 at 180, using spherical curves, we end up with the two prescriptions there in up gaze. We've got an error of about, well, the sill doesn't get corrected at all, and a bit extra plus. And in lateral gaze, we've added, we've added an extra two diopters of cylinder, and we've ended, and added another two diopters of plus. So that's not acceptable. Patients learn to move their heads around, look through the center of the glasses, and not look over there because it's blurry. And that's just single vision. If we were to do a front aspheric, then we end up on the right side with, a, with again, we have some extra astigmatism, not much, but it's better. But along the, the lateral meridian, then we end up with um, quite a bit of unwanted astigmatism correction minus an extra diopter and a little extra plus power. So plus lenses tend to, through spherical aberration, will increase the effective power in the periphery. So we flatten those curves out. It would be better if we could custom design the asphericity meridionally. So atoric lenses will have a different change in rate of power depending on the cylinder axis. And when we take those lenses and bend them, We can also then also correct in, in all meridia, and that's the secret behind the atoric back surface digital progressive and single vision lenses that are now in the marketplace. So that's a good way to give your patients a wider field of clear vision so they don't have to turn their head to see clearly. When you layer that on top of the progressive lens design, often the reason for reduced visual fields with progressive lenses, so we, we take a legacy lens, you know, lens with conventional um, front surface you know, from the 80s, and we put on a spherical back surface through a, a normal generating system, we end up with this situation. So you put that on top of the progressive corridor, and you end up with a lot of blur out here. So we need to think of those things when we're prescribing glasses for complex cases. And what's a complex case? Pretty much everybody. I don't think of any prescription being easier than another one. Minus one with a two ad is just as challenging as plus five with a three ad. Talk a little bit about the art of progressive lens design. I'm not going to talk about which lens is best because they all work. Best is a very subjective thing. And I don't want to get into that, into that discussion too much. But I do want to help you understand how you can figure out why things don't work sometimes. So the lens maker's soup, how he makes his lens. We have, we have, we have lenses that are soft and hard in progressive talk. So a hard progressive lens is one with a big reading area and a very short corridor. Okay? For example, I'll give you an example. In that case, that would be the Nikon IW. Whereas perhaps if it was a longer corridor, it would be like a Nikon Go or a Rodenstock AT in old, in old talk. So that would be a softer progressive lens. And some patients like a soft lens because it gives you a wider field of view and less distortion. What's happened these days, though, is we've changed the rules with digital progressives. By moving the surface that does the, the progressive onto the back surface, we actually make a hard design with a big area for reading behave like an old-fashioned soft design. So I really think that terminology has become a bit antiquated because lenses work better today. And it's confusing talking hard or soft or wide or narrow. I've tried them all, and, and there's not a big enough difference for those cases that I find it's worth talking about that much. 
What we do have, though, that's very important would be a short corridor versus a longer corridor. Now, when you think about corridor length, some manufacturers say, well, if the height is 22, you should do the long corridor, and if it's 18, you should do the medium corridor, and if it's 16 high, you should do the short corridor. Okay, maybe that works. I don't know. What might be more important to think about, though, is what the patient's needs are and where the frame sits on the face. So we think about corridor lengths. Okay, if I have a, if I have a, a larger nose and the frame sits away from me, so the vertex distance is quite great, when I look down, then the angle created by down gaze will, will require a longer corridor if my vertex distance is greater. So glasses are right here, maybe I need a long corridor, but if that frame sits close to my eyes, my vertex distance is maybe only five millimeters, then a long corridor is down by my cheeks. So I gotta go way down here to read. So we found you know, research that I didn't write has determined that about a 22 to 23 degree downward gaze is the most preferred by most people. So it makes sense that we use a longer corridor for, for great vertex distances and a short corridor for short vertex distances. Another thing to think about, too, is the effect that the magnification of a lens has on the corridor. So high minus corrections do better with short corridors, and high plus corrections do better with long corridors. It does get rather confusing. Now, back versus front. Most new lenses are back surface progressives. And there's a good reason for that. One, it enables the manufacturer to offer a much greater range of product. They don't have to have as big an inventory of SKUs. You know, each each ad, ad power in the old technology requires a different um, front mold. So you have ads from plus 75 up to plus 350. In steps, that's what, 10 or 12 different SKUs for each base curve for each material, right and left. If we can take a single vision blank and, and do our um, stuff on the back, we can reduce the number of inventory items dramatically. So I don't need to have a huge inventory of product. I can use the same blanks for all prescriptions. So there's a move to that way. Another benefit too is it, it makes better lenses. With one caveat, the manufacturer has to have the, the um, system in place that they can quality control their product. You know, just because you have a surfacing machine, a CNC surfacing machine, that's running to make these lenses, doesn't mean the lenses are coming out as designed. They need to be calibrated, maintained, um, they go down. It's a big, it's a, it's a really big deal that the, that the lab who manufactures the lenses has the depth to, to carry out the maintenance. And there's no way that you can check these lenses out. When you get them, how do you, how do you verify a progressive lens in the periphery? I don't have a machine for that. So I don't know if what I'm getting is what I really order. So that's the one caveat with digital lenses is that you, ha you really depend upon a good lab to make sure that the product you're ordering is the product you're getting. Um, anyway, let's... So let's talk about digital lenses and are they better? and why are they better? I'm gonna talk about the back surface ones exclusively. The front surface progressive lenses, there's not too many of them, I mean with the digital back surface, and they tend to be going away. So the big advantage is by moving the progressive corridor onto the back of the lens means that the magnification due to the shape factor is eliminated. So my magnification, or the difference, the difference between the distance and the near is constant now, it's zero. So that means I'm not increasing the base curvature in the reading part with a front surface progressive lens, it's the same throughout the whole lens. And so the old magnification equation that we did in the school means that we both reduce the dynamic and static anisoconia to within a point that we get less swim. And that's a good thing. So it behaves a bit more like a single vision lens. Of course, the power factor will cause that swimminess as well. 
We also get a wider field of view. Less magnification equals a wider field. This applies very much to plus lenses, very much to high ads. It's not quite as important in minus corrections because the power factor takes over. So your, so your hyperopes will definitely benefit from a back surface digital design. Your myopes may not notice as big a difference. Okay, so let's look at this. Keep that in mind. Prismatic lenses, big improvement with digital surfacing. I've, when I switch patients from legacy lenses into, into, into digital lenses with, um, with a prism, I've noticed one thing. The prism on the digital lens comes exactly as I order it, and the prism on the legacy lenses are within a diopter or two. So it's amazing that the digital lenses get the prism right because labs do not understand how to put prism into a lens. And the reason for that is when you tilt a lens, you induce prism. So unless the lens you're using knows the angle in front of the patient's eyes, the prism will be wrong. And prismatic lenses are thicker. It goes back to that position of wear thing. We need to measure the prism at the position of wear, not in the photometer. But because the lab who makes the lenses using legacy systems doesn't know what that is, they make them as though the lenses are flat this way. It's, optics are complicated. Okay. So if, if we were to look at the progressive uh, design and how it distorts, that's a reasonably good graphic. The right-hand side, you can see the back surface pal, and the left is the front surface pal. So perhaps up to 50% less, less distortion due to the power changes. Now, there's one issue though. Just because it's digital doesn't always make it better. There are cases when it's worse. It seems that most manufacturers who are manufacturing back surface digital lenses want to make them flat. They make them flat for two reasons. One is this perception that flatter lenses are more attractive and two, they are easier to polish in process. It's easier to polish a flat surface than a curvy one. So when you're polishing a curvy lens inside, you've got to make sure there's equal pressure of the polishing compound throughout the whole lens. Whereas with a flat lens, it's much easier to get even pressure on it when you do that final polish out of the CNC machine. So there's a tendency to make thin flat lenses for production ease. Number two, I guess they've kind of said, well, let's make that the standard. So we end up with very flat base curves, almost plano back surfaces, with the attendant difficulties in making them hit in the frame. One big problem with a flat base curve is if I'm giving you a minus four and it's on a 50 base, you put it into a frame with a four base and you get it back from the lab and it's come back like this. We've all had that problem. Then you've got to find a way to bring the temples in. When you do, you bend the bridge. When you bend the bridge, what happens now is that you're now inducing a lot of base in prism. Plus, when you ordered that expensive 3D digital lens, you said the face form is five degrees, and now you've adjusted it, now it becomes nine degrees. So now you've taken all that work that was done at the manufacturer, and you've negated it by changing the angle by five degrees, inducing prism and all kinds of weird things, and the patient goes, I don't know, Doc. I don't see any better than my old cheapy instinctives that you gave me two years ago. They were 75 bucks, whatever, and these are 350. So what's the big fuss about? And it's funny, patients often don't, myops especially, almost never complain about the size of the reading zone. But they are very susceptible to base in prism. Yeah, all prescription glasses induce anisoconia. It's a pretty broad statement. Okay? And I actually didn't want to, I want to show that one first. When we think of anisoconia, anybody who has gone to school when I went to school, maybe up until 2000, that's what we think of. We think image size differences. Okay? If I'm minus five, minus three, yeah, that's smaller, that's bigger. How do I deal with that? 
And remarkably, the human brain is very good at dealing with static anisoconia okay, in the normal eye. And that happens all the time because if I'm, to, if, if I'm looking at this glass, okay, I can see that. If I tilt, if at that distance, if I tilt my head 45 degrees, I've just created about a 10% image size difference because this eye is further back. It's at 45 centimeters and this eye is at 40 centimeters. Okay, it's about 10%, and that's the image size difference. And I can deal with that, not badly. The big problem that glasses do is this one. What we cannot deal with very well is spectacle-induced prismatic effect. And we know that because as optometrists, we routinely or can routinely measure the ability to adapt to forced ductions or vergences, or vergence facility, whatever you want to call it. And we measure that with the iodine prism. And we determine the break point with base in, base out, base up, and base down, prism to blur or break. And I think we need to go back to our roots as optometrists and think of what we do really well, and that's understanding how eyes work. Motor fusion, when I went to school, was beaten into us. We had to graph, you know those graphs we did in the undergrad? You know, the Virgil's accommodation and, and um, accommodative, you know, ACA ratios, all that stuff. Actually really important stuff. And now we have an application that helps us understand how glasses work. So when we think about prescribing glasses, the base curvature is very important in maintaining single clear vision in all directions of gaze. But it's hard to do that based on the knowledge we got in school. So here's a patient, we've, we've created anisoconia due to typical anisometropia. Two things are happening here. One is the base in prism, which is greater on the higher minus eye. So this is a minus five, this is a minus three. In lateral gaze, minus five eye left, minus three eye right means that this eye has more base in prism to deal with. Also, the bending of the, of the face form creates additional base in prism. And we even get prism when we have equal prescriptions in each eye. And the amount of prism changes based on the power, the thickness, the index, and the, base, and, and, and the face form angle. So why am I telling you all this? Because this affects how patients adapt to glasses. Yeah, they'll get used to it, sometimes. So hang on, I'm to find that slide, here we go. So how do we adapt to glasses? Take aspirin, Tylenol, whatever, close an eye. Sitting in a bar, I never do that usually. And my brother here, who's not an optometrist, points over to another optometrist, this is last week in Orlando at Vision Source, says, that guy's got anisoconia. I said, oh, come on, how can you tell? He's just sitting there in the bar having a beer. So is he. He says, he's closing one eye to look at the sports scores. So I went over, and he's, I, knew, I knew it was, and he's an optometrist from, from Colorado. Took his glasses off and says, yeah, he does. Minus 250 in plano. He was adapted. He wore his glasses. Took him off to read. Okay. Looked at the sports scores by closing his plano eye, because his minus 250 eye was a little bit better. And... Um, I don't know. He was adapted. Another optometrist there, same bar. Maybe it's the beer. <laughs> anyway, so he was, um, again, from, um, I don't know, northern U.S. somewhere in the west, Wisconsin, not the Wyoming or Montana, I don't know. Forget. That's what bars do to you. So he was sitting like this all the time with his head tilted a bit. And I said, so... Let me see. And I could tell looking at him, he's like, he was, had a high plus in one eye and a moderate plus in the other eye. I said, have you ever considered fixing that? He says, well, I don't know. I'm adapted. And he says, okay, fine, no problem. So again, my brother Michael started talking to him, and, and, and the doctor came up to him the next day. He said, I hate you. I was perfectly happy before. Now I notice I'm diplopic in every position of gaze. Because <laughs> he told me I was, because he's used to turning his head. So, you know, people adapt because they don't know what 
it can be like if they were seeing properly. And I think our job of, as optometrists is to identify those patients who are happy, they think they're happy, and show them perhaps that we can make their vision better. I have another patient. Now this goes, goes back. She was, she's the IT, head of IT at the hospital I work at. She was 42, comes in for routine checkups. She's wearing plus 125 OU. In progressives, not very happy. She had, like a, they gave her a 250 ad at 42. It happens a lot, by the way. Not from optometrists. Well, not from optometrists in, in private practice. Uh, gave her examination. She's plus two and plus 450. 20, 20, 20 over 200. Okay? So I said to her, well, we can, maybe we can do something here with you. And this actually ties back into the internet stuff. When we, talk, when we talk to patients, if we can offer them something better than they had before, not just do the same, go the extra distance. I said, I'm going to treat your lazy eye. She says, oh, you can't. You, can't fi you cannot fix that. I've been told by 20 doctors my whole life that I will never see. I said, okay, I like challenges. So why don't we do this? So I designed her a pair of isogonal lenses. You know what that is? Equal magnification in each eye. Now, why can I do that without having a uh, yeah, thing, those Remol um, iconometers? Anybody here got a Remol iconometer? You have a Remol iconometer. Okay. Do you use it? <laughs> no. <laughs> so an iconometer is a very interesting thing for school, but in practice, you don't need one. So what, I, what, the, what the thought is here, if a patient is happy with glasses off and they don't have horror fusionis, which I've seen a few times, why don't we make the glasses work like they're not wearing glasses? How many patients have you seen that were unsuccessful cataract lens patients or post-cataract patients when the surgeon re re returned them to Plano in each eye, even if they were, you know, anti before? They're all pretty happy. They don't not adapt to having emotropic vision. So if we take a, a, a strategy and try, to main, and try to bring that patient back to normality, they're often, they're often happier. Anyway, the upshot of this patient was, I made her a pair of, uh, in those days it was 2002, or two, yeah, 2002, I gave her a pair of Progressive Life, uh, two lenses from Rodenstock, short, sorry, XS, short corridor, I balanced the um, magnification in each eye using Dr. Arnie Ramol's equations you did from school. And within six months, six months that, that vision in her weaker eye had returned to 2050 from 2200. And I saw her again last time in 2008. Oh, no, no, 2010, 2025, and 2020. Now, why do, why do amblyopes get better? That's a, not a question I'm going to answer today. But we do think binocular summation is really important. So we need to be optometrists. We need to be a little bit outgoing and understand optics to make that work better. So adaptation is, is really what you define it as. And whether it's just putting up with glasses or whether it's making the patient have truly clear single binocular vision without amblyopia, if that's your goal, then I think that's a good thing. And that will maintain your practice. If it's taken the path of least resistance, saying, yeah, they're all pretty good lenses and no problem. Yeah, just get it filled. Yeah, my optician will do it for you or my assistant will do it for you. And I think we create, our own, uh, we, we create our own demise by not impressing enough on the patient what we really do. So I just want to get back a little bit you know these things? Third order aberrations. Yeah, I don't know what to make of those. Glasses will not correct those. Intraocular lenses can, and there's a lot of work in IOLs with this. There's the Zernike circles and all that stuff, and I'm not even going to talk about that, because there's no place for that with spectacles. Spectacles create first order aberrations. So wavefront technology is a way to look at how the light propagates through a lens, and we can certainly increase the clarity, but let's not get too wrapped up on things we don't understand. Does anybody here understand what this stuff means? You don't need to. So enough about optics. Let's talk a bit about physiology. 
And that's what optometrists are really good at. We did learn this stuff. It's just that we don't really apply it in practice at the level we needed to know about it when we wrote our board exams. Yeah, we don't, smooth muscles, extraocular muscles do not get stronger. They stay the same throughout our entire life. So, so how do we adapt? Saccadic eye movements, fast, right? Vergences, slow. So if I have to make a saccade, and then I need to make a divergent motion movement to keep things fused, if I can make that divergent movement smaller, that patient's gonna be able to make fixation faster. Same with verticals. If I can keep the verticals happy, again, that patient is happier. The problem with thin, flat lenses is that you may find that the patient was happy in legacy lenses. Let's say they're wearing SLR Comfort. Very happy patient. SLR Comfort had higher base curves. And then you put them into a Zeiss or a Nikon or a Seiko lens with, or Hoya lens with very flat base curves. In fact, there's a new Seiko out with very flat curves. And then there's that new Nikon CMAX. And you may find, if there's any face form angle with that flat base curve, you've suddenly induced a lot of base-in prism in lateral gaze, and so they have to make that adjustment all the time. They say, yeah, things are swimmy. I don't know, it's just like, I, these, don't, these aren't my glasses. And they just spend a lot of money on them. So maybe we should think about how the glasses affect the binocularity. And it's not easy. We can't train negative fusional versions very well, and we certainly can't train verticals very well. Okay. Some people have very high tolerance to vertical prism. Usually kids that wear their glasses like this, and they've learned to adapt since the age of four. So, the, so a young child wearing glasses that are very, you know, from, from early will have better vergences than someone who comes with the glasses at the age of 20 or 16. And that may be because the human vision system, think about it, there's no reason for my eyes ever to need to diverge if I'm not wearing glasses. I never have to have my eyes pass parallel because I'd be diplopic. The same rationale goes vertical. If I'm not wearing glasses, there's no reason to have to learn to do this because there's no, there's no stimulus to vertical prism if I have a pretty normal vision system. Glasses certainly do create prismatic effect and the earlier you start wearing glasses, the better you train adaptation to prismatic effect. So late eyeglass wearers have difficulty with induced prism. At least that's been my experience. <clears throat> I believe that less anisoconia is always better. Because if patients are happy with contacts in, that's zero anisoconia. Zero dynamic, zero static, no interocular prismatic difference. I don't know, contacts are great. As I like to tell people, glasses suck, okay? Because they do create a, a, an environment of distortion. So we have to think, do we want to have a monocular lens design or a binocular lens design? And how do you figure out which is which? There is one lens on the marketplace that does address that, but I don't. It's kind of awkward here because I'm trying to talk about progressive lenses, but I need to tell you about this. And we need to think about how we per perceive optometry and glasses and what we can do to make our patients happier. I have developed a method, and this is free software, by the way, that you can download, of assessing what the prismatic effect is across the visual field with spectacle lenses. Now this method is a bit self-serving because what we're comparing it to is a digital progressive design from the same company using conventional, um, we call them LMS or lens management system chosen lenses. So when you do an order and you don't specify base curve or thickness, that's what you're gonna get with the majority of digital lens manufacturers. And what I've done is we've, I've, through ray tracing, I've mapped out from in lateral gaze and vertical gaze what the exact prismatic effect is on the fusional vergence system. Sorry for the long words. 
And this particular patient on the bottom, you can see minus 275 in the right eye with minus the quarter still at 180. Ah, okay. And minus 125 in the left eye. And you might look at that and say, yeah, I don't know, that's not a big deal. I do that all the time and people seem to be happy. And maybe they're not. Down here is the key. If their fusional vergence limits, base up one and a half, base down one and a half, let's say they never wore glasses before. Because they're minus 125, maybe they were minus a half and minus two when they were 15, and they put up with the monovision a long time. But now they've progressed to the point where, the mono, where they're a bit more myopic. It's actually a real patient. And when we look at the um, base in prism, not bad, three and a half, okay, and base out for 11. So that's fairly typical of a lot of patients that you see. When we map out what the prismatic effect is on the visual field with conventionally designed lenses using LMS lens management system, lens base curves, the dark blue area here would be the binocular congruent visual field, meaning this is where my eyes have single clear binocular vision and everybody's happy. The lighter blue area is kind of that no man's land of fixation disparity. I'm just getting, just at the break point. So maybe I'm diplopic but I don't notice it because the, the diplopia is small enough that I can suppress it within that very narrow area. And once you get into the pink area, I'm diplopic. And this patient actually, interesting, um, wasn't a very good golfer because the left field is diplopic with the glasses on. Left gaze, I'm pink. So when I'm putting, like this, looking to the left from the line of putter, I'm a bit diplopic. So I don't really get the full effect of my vision. By, by, adapt, by changing the base curvature and thickness, we can equalize to a certain extent the dynamic stimulus to fusion and increase it. Yeah, we can fix minus. It's possible to fix myopes who have anisoconia. Down, so, the, so the amount of prism generated at 30 degrees off center is 3.3 diopters, base in prism, and we've reduced that to 1.4 here. And the vertical, we've gone from four diopters in the reading zone down to 1.1. Now, we did shorten the corridor. One of the tools we do have is not to ask the patient to move their eyes too much. Okay? So using a standard height for that, let's say that was a 22 high progressive, we can certainly shorten that corridor to reduce the amount of effect of the, of the prismatic effect. And also we did manage, even though there's a small amount of static anisoconia here, it's only 1.3%, that wasn't the problem, it was the motor stuff. So we need to think motor fusion. The one time where we need to really pay attention to the static anisoconia is in the treatment of amblyopia. Studies published by Bilbobia, and there's a whole list of, there's a new bibliography. Binocular summation is where it's happening. So whether you're doing VT therapy for straps, whether we're doing anisoconic therapy for straight eye amblyopia, we need to get fusion to happen and then the visual cortex will increase the acuity in the amblyopic eye. This isn't a BB lecture. Well, it might, it might be. So, other binocular issues. Is it all painted, though? I don't know. <laughs> I'm the same way. I still can't put short ones, but my long putts are a lot better. So I have this. I had the same issue, and I change my base curvatures to increase my lateral gaze. I'm diplopic on right gaze still, but on left gaze I'm not diplopic. Now I can actually see one hole. Or you saw two. Well, it was easier with two. So I missed that one, I should go on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so we have an intraocular size difference. That's anisoconia, of course. Intraocular prismatic effect, that's the dynamic anisoconia. And we also have to little worry a little bit about inset geometry. So another thing too, is that some lenses have fixed insets and some don't. 
all the new technology have variable inset so that the corridor is, is lined up with the reading part. So the best thing to do is use the lenses that have the face form angle requirement. If you're going to go digital, go with lenses with the face form angle because that will get the inset right. The earlier, like the, the, the Seiko first generation, Nikon WI, I don't know whichever that one is. There, actually, that's, that's a front surface progressive with a fixed inset. Um, what else is there? Those have fixed insets, 2.4 and 2.2 millimeters. They're good for like plus two when the 64 eye size, but they don't work well for a high minus in a, in a small frame because the inset required for a minus six with a PD of 56 is about 1.2 millimeters, and the inset required for a plus four with a 58 eye size would be about four millimeters. So 2.2 is an average, but I don't know. I'm an optometrist. I don't like working in averages. What's an average correction? Plano? Plus one? So give everybody plus, so give all the myops minus three and all the pipots plus three and you'd be happy. So, we, so, we, so lens manufacturers, in order to make lenses easy, have normalized things and so that we don't have too much input requirement. Talk about some binocular vision red flags. So these are the things that will make a myope really unhappy if you get the face form and base curve and thickness wrong. Esophoria with associated divergence insufficiency. They don't tolerate base in very well. When the higher the myopia, the greater the face form, and the flatter the lens, the bigger the problem. So that's a good place to look if you're having trouble with adaptation, is think of that. And again, what is adaptation? I had another patient who I, I actually didn't do her binocular vision tests, and she failed. Well, I failed. So she was minus four and a half OU, roughly. I put her into the new prescription, minus 250 and minus 425, whatever. So she says, she comes back to me, and says, it's glasses. I see great with them, but I think I have a brain tumor. Okay, what happened? I see double in left gaze. I've got a six nerve palsy, she's told me. She's, a, she's doing a master's of public health, so she went up and read, oh, I can't see left gaze, what, what does that mean? I said, okay, take off her glasses and do... No, you're fine. Let's have a look here. Then I examined her lenses, and I have that software that measures where the breakpoint would be. So I measured her base infusional demand. I mean, her base in acceptance. I said, you should be dyslopic right about there, and she was. Okay, because on that pair of glasses, I did not attend to, do the, to, the, to the design of the lens, and it was the glasses-induced dynamic anisoconia causing diplopia. 425, base in prism on the right eye. 250, okay, less base in prism on left gaze. Base out prism, yeah, sorry, base out prism left gaze. Yep, or less base in. <laughs> so she was experiencing a lot of base in on left gaze. It was about five diopters at 15 degrees, and she couldn't fuse that. So she was pretty observed and said, yeah, I'm T double over there. So I did fix it. We did change the base curves. And I, think she, I, I, think, I think I fixed it, but she hasn't come back. Plus, I could tell her why it's a problem. So we can't always fix problems, but if you tell patients that, yeah, we need a different frame with a flatter base, with, with, with a flatter design. Okay. Can you go to that second line, myopia, base form, and flatter curves? What's the issue there? So the higher the myopia, the, 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 the greater the face form, and the flat of the base curve. So if you have a nine degree face form, like an Adidas frame, you know those Adidas metal frames used to have? If you were to put that in a standard digital progressive lens, and it says minus five, it'll come back on a two base, it's gonna induce a lot of base in prism. And that patient will not be happy. So we need to increase the base curve on those patients, on those frames. So base curve is the critical element in progressive lenses. Steeper is always better. Remember the churning ellipse we did in school? Okay. That was re with regards to, spherical, to um, marginal astigmatism. It also applies to binocular vision too. Because what happens is the following. When you have lenses that are curved, if I have a curvy lens, as I look through it, if, 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 the, if the primary visual axis 
is always perpendicular to the tangent of the lens, there's no prism. So the, the more acute that angle is, the greater the prism is. It just makes sense. If you take a flat piece of glass in front of you and you tilt it, things move. If it's a curved lens and you do that, they move less. So curvy prisms, so curved lenses have less dynamic anisoconia induced than flat lenses. We didn't learn that in school. That's something I've discovered through ray tracing. And it does make sense. If you put glasses at, on a 14 base, but there used to be a 14 base glass system solar in Australia, no dynamic anisoconia, just the, just, just the power factor, not the shape factor. So we've neutralized that power factor and that shape factor. I know it's complicated. And this opposite applies to plus lenses. If we go too flat with a plus lens and a face form, and we have exophoria or convergence insufficiency, again, flat, for, flat we induce base out prism and convergence insufficiency, they don't like to be asked for more convergence. So you figure, oh, you put these lenses on, these wonderful new digital lenses, really flat base curves, you 167 index, you put them on like a four base on a plus three, whatever they come out as, and now Seiko have a product with a convex back surface, so they go really flat, and that might work with a very flat frame, with a very flat face, but it doesn't work with a curvy frame because now you're asking for all this base out prism, and it's substantial. I had one patient, she was, uh, actually she had a chromatopsia, and the last optometrist had given her um, corning CPF lenses, you know, to cut all the blue light out. And it was a wraparound frame, and they put a six base. She was plus six. Very flat back curves. And she, even though she was 20 over 100, she says, if I turn my head that much, I see double. I said, I know what the problem with that is. You've got a 15-degree wrap. You've got a six diopter base curve, and that's causing diplopia. So... Just keep that in mind. Another red flag, anisometropia. We all know that one. That's the obvious one. And we should think about that a bit more. It does get complicated. So this is my quick and dirty summary. If I, should have, I could have showed that slide first, and then you could have all gone home. <laughs> Digital backside progressive lenses are usually better from a monocular standpoint. They will correct the atoris, they will correct astigmatism better, wider field of view, less swim, better monocular vision. Flat base curves always contribute to binocular dysfunction. Okay? Adaptation is faster. When you, fix, when you correct the dynamic anisoconia and lenses that, in, that minimize distortions, both monocular and binocular distortion. So if we use a digital backside lens and we make it steeper and we really attend to the dynamic anisoconia, I think it's always better. It's never worse. And that's where my disclaimer comes in. And you can take a look at a brochure. You can look at the website. I'm not, I don't want to do a sales thing, but I think it's a really optometric issue that we can all deal with. And it's up to you to decide when you want to invoke advanced technology for binocular vision, and that's what we do. Let's bring it back to binocular vision, and that's what we own. Thank you for your patience and understanding the question.